guys, and welcome back to episode 106 of the NH2A podcast, where we discuss anything related to the Second Amendment, including firearms, gear, and current events. I'm your host, Jacob Clifford, joining my co-host, Jared Mitchell. And today we're going to talk about SHOT Show 22, some new products, and um, the uh, Rare Breed FRT Trigger, latest on that. Um, first of all, personal news. Um, well, it's been a month. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, it's literally like been a month, because I've been in Colorado. You guys may have not noticed... Yeah, you guys probably, yeah, uh, other than maybe if you follow us on Instagram, you might have noticed a little bit, but um, yeah, because we had pre-recorded the last bunch last year. The last um, four of them, yeah. Yeah, the last uh, last four we pre-recorded, so this is the first one where it's going to be straight farm to table with this podcast today, you know what I'm saying? And, and so, we, we are a uh, day late, so apologize for that. Yeah, so way she goes. Um, we also have a live studio audience for the first time in 106 episodes. My dog is joining us. Um, he probably won't bother us because he's just sleeping and staring. Hopefully but, not. Yeah. You know, he's, he's unpredictable, though. So, um, anyways, um, so personal news. Um, I ended up, from a good friend, acquiring this, uh, this old Surefire. I forget the model number. I feel stupid. I should have looked at it, but it's on the other side. Um, it's an old school, like, early 2000s Surefire. I'll have to... Look up the model at some point, but um, it's got the kind of old school, obnoxiously large tail cap with the button on one end, and then the spot for the tape switch on the bottom. So I got to acquire another tape switch for sure, a uh, Surefire, um, so I can put it on that. So it kind of goes with the whole block one build, you know. Um, so I'm excited about that. I went to um, while I was out west, I went to Idaho's largest Army Navy store, which I'm not sure how much of a flex that is because I've never been to another Idaho <laughs> Army Navy store like surplus store. But apparently they're the largest. And um, the only reason I know is because they were right off the interstate. And I was like, well, I need gas anyways. And that place looked pretty cool. So I stopped. And I picked up a, an M81 uh, rucksack cover. So that was good. That was a good uh, acquisition. So kind of uh, recce related. You know, that's something Grantham brought up in his videos. So I was excited about that. And I also picked up this, uh, this like, um, universal 80s Army holster. Um so it's a cool holster. I actually like it because of just how purely utilitarian is it is. So I got the M9 in it right now because I imagine primarily that's what was inside of it. Um, so yeah, I'm rocking the M9 in that right now. It's got like this little kind of like bungee hook deal that wraps around and you pull it down a little bit and it hooks. Very simple. I've known their existence for years, but I don't normally see them at Army Surplus stores. Um, I saw one years ago and I didn't buy it and I kind of regretted it like low key because I just think they're, they're just, they're kind of nice. Um, I was actually doing some dry fire with it yesterday and be honest with you, it actually, for being dated, it's rather effective. Like it's very easy to just grab that real quick and just get after it. It also has a little snap on the front and a, sh a little like little shoot here that's actually meant for your cleaning rod. So you can put your cleaning rod in there and snap it closed. Yeah, kind of neat, right? Very, very One of the few uh, old products army. the military got right. Yeah, like they, they were very, you know. Um, apparently it's the M12 holster by Weckworth Manufacturing. Um, and the, uh, the actual, like, the belt kind of attachment unit is pretty straightforward. It's just these two little, little pretty robust metal hooks that kind of open up, you know, slap the old belt in there. And then, uh, boom, you can also do, like, the traditional loop if you have, like, a small belt. I'm imagining kind of my kind of theory on it is that originally this was meant for the web gear belt and that was meant for those little tiny black belts that went with BDUs. Um, and then it also it almost looks uh, ambidextrous, come to think of it. I'm pretty sure you can actually remove this and put it over oh. here. So it's uh, that's that's kind of neat. I just noticed that. And this they, is, yeah, this is ambidextrous. Out, they yeah. even looked out for lefties. Back yeah, there. dude. Like it should warm your heart. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like So that's kind of cool too. So it's ambidextrous, and uh, yeah, and also when you open it up, you only get it if you're a righty, of course. It says a U.S., which is always kind of neat. Um, yeah, but so kind of cool. It also fits the 1911. So most most semi-autos without lights will fit. So uh, we even noticed that the uh, the Glock 21 in all of its glory fits a little snug, but it fits nonetheless. So <laughs> it's kind of a cool holster to have around because if you're for some reason, want to or need to carry a gun, say, open out in the woods or something, it's a it's a pretty solid little, like, general purpose holster. And it seems like it, you know, it's quick enough. So, kind of neat, though. Yeah. And it all obviously also fits the M&P 45. Doesn't fit a 1917 revolver, if you were curious. Yeah, but, so many auto loaders you should yeah, be set. Yeah, pretty much auto loaders, but it's a pretty robust little nylon holster. And 
I don't know. I was happy that I finally picked one up because they are really neat. So yeah, kind of kind of a cool little setup, you know. Um, yeah, and then obviously uh, both Jared and I were out, and uh, I was there for a little longer, and then uh, Jared flew out for a few days. Yeah. Um, out at a, this ranch in Colorado, um, and we were looking for for coyotes, and uh, we didn't find any, unfortunately. Didn't hear any. Didn't see any. No, it was surprising. They were all there until we got there, um, apparently, allegedly. And so, that being said, it was a really fun opportunity to use the nods under some kind of different environments. Like, I've used nods in Colorado before because I was stationed in Colorado, but like. Not in that necessarily, like that format, like up in the mountains, being able to, the LPVO, the first time I was able to use like an LPVO out west too. Yeah. Kind of cool to be able to um, see those longer distances and really see what they're kind of made of, you know what I mean? And so, yeah. I don't know, it was, it was a cool opportunity to kind of stretch our, stretch our legs. And we didn't do like any much like long range shooting or anything, but being able to kind of just view things in a different biome, if you will, yeah. um, well, was really interesting. The interesting thing is, out in Colorado, it's actually fairly sunny. <laughs> and low yeah. cloud cover even at night so that meant pretty much every night the moon was out yeah. to some extent the loom was great yeah yeah except the last night i was there so i was there five five or four nights five days i guess um yeah but with the flight it was you know closer to three full days but anyways um every night it was very bright out um because of that cloud cover which was nice um, yeah. environment was a little different so everything had kind of um, a brighter sense to it as compared to uh we're used to a lot more overcast stuff especially you know in the winter um other things like camo considerations were kind of interesting because yep. everything's dead there uh, for a majority of the year um, yeah so, it's very dry very <clears throat> rocky you know it's in the rocky mountains yeah so. Like, I took a picture, or you took a picture of me standing next to the dead kind of hay kind of looking grass. Yeah, that kind um, of dead. And then yeah. there's, like, red rocks in the distance and then pine trees. And that's kind of your environment. So, yeah. actually, surprisingly enough, like, we, I, I have, like, uh, duck fabric pants. And the, the actual name of them is wheat. And that blended in, like, perfectly with, like, the dead grass. Yeah. No, it's, it's one of those things where... Um, I've seen multicam out in that environment, and multicam works fairly well. Yep. Um, you know, so it's a, definitely a consideration for multicam. I even think you could almost get away, because of the weird environment, you could almost get away with, like, a mixture of multicam and M81. Um, or some sort of arid. Yep. Uh, yeah, multicam arid, I bet, would work yeah. outstanding yeah. out there. Um, and then there's that, the Cryptek stuff. I've seen people, a lot of people hunt with Cryptek out there. Yep. Um, I'm sure that would work kind of more arid colored Cryptek. Um, ATAX, maybe. I, I don't even think anybody talks about ATAX anymore. Um, that was a, that, that really, that really peaked quick. Remember yeah. ATAX? Yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine ATAX would work very well out there yeah. if, it was, if anybody ever still used it. It's just kind of one of those things that uh, I'd recommend to people if you do have the ability to at some point like this was kind of a special circumstance but um, get out and travel and just see different environments kind of get get explore uh, get out and explore get out into the woods um, for instance like we drove four wheelers around the mountains yeah um, you know we were in kind of horse country apparently there's mountain lions in the area so just another reason to stay strapped yeah uh, and- just just cool environments yeah, no, and that's the cool thing is being able to, not only being able to travel is really fun, but being able to just wander in yeah. different parts um, is really cool experience. You know, being able to just kind of free roam, wander in the in the Rockies, like on on a massive ranch, was really cool because you just kind of got to explore on your own and just pick around and see what was going on. Um, yeah, we did some off roading too. Yeah, um, yeah, in and, a 1973 CJ. <laughs> yeah, the old CJ five. Yeah. Um, uh, you can you can check that. I think I posted some of them on my Instagram of it. Um, yep. Just cool stuff like that, man. And uh, having the um, having the air be so thin as well, uh, like on a because like we've all been uh, like up in the mountains, like up up in the mountains, and kind of had the the thin air effect. Like, but when like the actual kind of base camp, if you will, is ten thousand yep. feet, you um, you definitely feel the thin air. I mean, like just going up the stairs. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, also, like, even, like, getting a cold, I got a cold up there, you can probably still hear from my voice, um, it messes you up, man, I feel like my lungs are scarred or something, like, I, I've, I've been kind of out of commission voice-wise for a minute now, I yeah. mean, since you were there, you know what I mean, and the cold's, for the most part, been over, but that extra, extra elevation, how dry it is up there, really, really, yeah. you, uh, you notice a little bit extra, but, um, yeah, it was cool, it was a cool experience, though, it was really fun, um, also, get to really test out lights. 
like it was a fun experience at night, you know, testing out the uh, mod lights and, and this old girl and yep. and stuff like that. Being able to see kind of just because there's so much just raw distance there, um, just really seeing like how they do, you know, looking at rocks in the distance and whatnot. So, um, yeah, so definitely, uh, definitely cool experience. But yeah, any personal news on your end? No, that was mostly it. I don't, I don't think I have any product. <coughs> news i've actually been looking at getting some more magazines and i think i'm just gonna get some some aluminum like sure feeds yeah. um, how much do you remember how much you paid for yours i think 10 9.99 okay so I, I thought they were a little cheaper but i guess not um sometimes you can find surplus ones for yeah. like eight bucks or something but it makes the math easy for me is the way i look at it like okay if it's 9.99 i can you know it's 10 bucks a piece you know, just boop, okay, because i was looking around and i saw some for 10 or 11 and i was like that sounds high yeah. I, but it, if that's the average, then... Because you bought yours a while ago. So. Yeah, these are from August of 20, is what, apparently when they were produced. Yeah. Um, no, I I have had really good luck with these. I, I suggest these. I've And I've run these quite a bit. I'm going to transition to a point where I'm going to try to start keeping a good fleet of these for training as well. Because I do have a kind of a weird menagerie of magazines. Like, because I really... Like, I have... There's a handful of these I really have, you know, put the hammer down on. But, like, I'd like to run, say, five of them that are for training just so I can really, really make sure that they're as awesome as I think they are. Yeah, and, and I'm actually, as I kind of get farther into this, I'm more of a proponent of duty mags versus training mags. Um, yes. Just because mags are, they are an expendable piece. Um, nowadays, because mags are so good, we don't really view it as such. It's yes. more of like a, oh, I buy it and I have six or seven mags or ten or whatever and then I'm good. But it's not a bad idea just to have... You know, and I, a box full of them ready to go. And I try to do that too, you know what I mean? Like, and, and for the most part, like, I also try not to keep bad magazines around. Like, I think um, it's kind of, it's one of those things, like, if I have a magazine that starts having problems, I try to just, I try to throw it in like a box or something that's like specifically for like bad parts or throw it out if it's not like an expensive <coughs> mag. Like, I actually had a, um, a Gen 5 mag that's starting to fail on me. Um, I have a, like Glock. a Gen 5 Glock mag. Mm -hmm. my, one of my 19 magazines, I was, um, I was changing out from, oh, that was another thing while I was out in Colorado, I switched to HSTs. Um, but I was switching out that critical duty to HSTs, and um, it the the follower was st stuck all the way down. Hmm. And, like, it wasn't, like, just, like, it lagged a little bit. Like, the last five or six rounds were in there, and I had to shake them out. And then eventually, I think I, swat, uh, like, swatted it on the table a few times, and it finally kick back up so I'm gonna pull it apart and clean it but I'm definitely um I took all of them out and I like kind of took the base plate half off so I knew and then I set that um I set that over uh on my like next to my workbench where all my bad magazines go because yeah. hmm. I'd like to investigate that um so that's kind of interesting so uh kind of pays one thing to do maybe do occasionally if you don't shoot your uh, carry mags a lot number one just you know maybe shoot them a little bit but also it doesn't hurt to um, have to say unload your ammo. So like it's another benefit of like switching out carry ammos occasionally is being able to sit yeah. there and unload to see if your followers working properly and your you know your follower spring. So just kind of a just kind of a thought that I kind of was uh, that kind of reinforced in my mind very recently. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, on to the episode. So yeah. in this episode, we're going to highlight I think six products uh, that we found interesting from Shot Show 2022. Um, Probably, as you guys are aware, if you're kind of into this kind of stuff, SHOT Show kind of had a weird kind of vibe to it this year because the organization that hosts, um, not hosts, but actually, like, puts on SHOT Show, they um, mandated masks. And then, come to find out, everybody that got there was just like, nope, we're not going to wear them. Yeah. Uh, so, no. <laughs> a majority of people, I can't say everyone, but... Everybody's so, just kind of like, we're not we're not. There was a lot anymore. of people, I, I can't... Probably not a lot, but there were some people that said they were not going because of the mandate of masks. And then there are other vendors that just purely didn't go because they didn't want to put their employees at uh, risk of some sort of exposure. So Colt was not there. Benelli was not there. Cloud Defensive wasn't there. But that was mostly because they're focused on building their new products opposed to putting everything oh, back a week or two because of timelines. Which uh, is fair. Which is pretty admirable. Yeah. You know? I mean... There's been a push in the industry to kind of get away from SHOT Show anyway, so this might be kind of like one of the last nails in the coffin. Um, mm. I've, I've he heard a lot of talk of people that say doing regional shows or more 
more shows that are based on actual person interaction opposed to these big uh, events. Yeah, there's just so much that I think gets shadowed. Yeah, and like, it's it's really it's not even consumer based. So like I've been to one NRA show uh, back when I was in the military. So this was years ago. This was it 2019. I went to the Georgia. Uh, well, it was in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to the NRA show, and that's the equivalent to Shot Show for for the consumer. Which was great because it's very consumer minded. So you get to go in there. Anybody that's at the time a member of the NRA was able to go in and, um, you know, just fondle different products essentially, yeah, um, cool. which was great. But the problem with that show now is that the NRA is the way the NRA is. So yeah, the NRA. Nobody yeah. wants to support them. So we kind of need these other shows, these trade shows to pop up that are very consumer oriented and very like person to person oriented. Um, because shot shows exclusive if you're not aware, so you you have to have a connection. You got to have an industry connection, a media connection. You got to have some sort of connection to get in. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of unfortunate. Uh, Which it is kind of cool to see a lot of like the gun YouTube community, like all the cool guys kind of get together. You know what I mean? It's kind of it's like a cool opportunity to see that, I guess. You know what I mean? Like you see like Grand Thumb and like Brandon Herrera and everything yeah. kind of together. But like it is, it, it, I think it's gotten a little uppity in some yeah. time. And a lot of the guys who are that YouTube kind of gun community, a lot of the reasonable guys are are noticing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. They show up, but they're just kind of like, yeah, this is getting a little bit much. You know what I mean? And I, it, yeah, I, I think it's weird. And it, I guess it would be difficult to have um, a con, maybe a consumer-based, um, such a massive event be um, consumer-based just because of the massive amount of people that would show up. Well, I mean, NRA show back in the day used to bring, they brought out quite a few people. Yeah, and I imagine so. I remember seeing like James Yeager there. Like, yeah, and there's just a lot of, like even even somewhat like, gun famous people would show up at the NRA show. Yeah, but with politics the way they are with the NRA, it's not yeah. really. Versus regional shows would be very interesting. You know yeah. what I mean? Because there's no reason as long as you did them at different times. You know, there's no reason people couldn't go to every one. Like people would, and you might get better exposure to a lot of these products. You yes. know what I mean? Like, because I I've noticed that too. So like. That kind of format is definitely not ex- exclusive to the gun community. Like you see yeah. that with, um, you know, the vehicles. And actually, at the same time, Shot Show was going on, there was a massive tool expo in Las Vegas as well. Like yep. Milwaukee showed off a bunch of new stuff, and so I was kind of, I was all in awe, you know, on Instagram because it was all guns and yeah. Milwaukee tools. We well, also got you, know? you got like SEMA, yep. for, for vehicles and off road stuff. Yep, and uh, just I, I, it's weird because it's like the season for it for some reason because there was just a massive like. Um, septic workers, uh, like a massive shit expo, essentially. This is like, your dad always talk about the concrete one. Yes, well, he goes to the septic one too. There's a New Hampshire septic one he goes to to keep his license. And because uh, what they'll do is a lot of other companies, like if you want to keep your certifications, they'll make you go to a, like a certain amount of expos every certain amount of years yeah. and stuff and kind of take little like mini classes. So it's kind of interesting because I think as from the gun community, like unless you're maybe in the trades, like you don't realize that like it's. It's just that of the, kind of the gun world, you know what I mean? It's yeah. kind of cool, though. And but I like, kind of like the idea that you get to talk to the manufacturer. You get to talk to, sometimes it might be the actual mom-and-pop shops. You might talk to, like, yeah. the actual maker um, or even a salesman that might have some insight or maybe an engineer um, on that product, which is kind of cool. Oh, 100%. But um, kicking it off, kind of my impression uh, from obviously not being there but from seeing the media coverage I am kind of predicting this year to be the year of high power weapon metal lights yeah. uh, or handhelds. So just pretty much um, lights in general. Um, yeah, we think they must have listened to our podcast because they all just did exactly what we said. Kind of interesting. What Mike said. Yeah, kind of interesting because we literally just talked about this subject um, a couple episodes ago. Um, how we were we were yearning for a better product, and now three manufacturers are making steps towards, at least three that I'm aware of, are making steps towards what might be the ideal weapon light for me uh, based on my experience with cloud and mod light. Yeah. So we kind of talked about Surefire, how they've kind of been there, done that, and then weren't really progressing. Well, yeah, these guys. Yeah, like the These are proven, All right, proven like... from the 80s up to the early 2000s, and then even up till now, you still got people running 600 series. Yeah, I, I, run a sure, I ran a Surefire handheld for a long yeah, time. Yeah, boom. Like, you got the whole shebang, you know what I'm saying? Like, they've been they've been around for a minute. Like, like you know, they were they were making bullnose Fords and they were making these, yeah. all right? Like, they were, they were, put it this way, they were, they were making lights when 
vehicle companies are still making carbureted vehicles. So, side note, you know? um, this isn't my actual light item, but another light item that Model Light's coming out with. They're actually making heads that are going to work off these kind of older school Surefire handheld bodies. Uh, because these are a thinner profile than like most weapon metal lights. Yeah. So they're coming out with Model Light specific heads that are going to have high output, but they're still going to run on the CR123s that the Surefire takes. That's cool. um, the runtime is so, going to be very poor. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> from what I from so, what I saw, the run runtime is not going to be great. Which is going to be kind of the only thing versus like, my only thing with an like a obnoxiously powerful handheld is battery life. Yeah. And sometimes it's just plain overwhelming. Like a lot of times I use these on like you know like looking at engines task lights, and yeah. you know it's a task light and so like the two stage is very important. Of course we covered this and um, we covered this before. You know what I mean? But so I wonder. Because they're coming out with a head, I wonder if that head is going to offer the capabilities of the tail cap. I wonder how that's going to all pan out. But oh yes, because it's a two stage. It's got the aug trigger yes. on it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's <laughs> <laughs> I forgot the aug. Yeah. Um, uh. And so that's going to be kind of the only thing. Um, but yes, yeah, so that'd be kind of interesting. I think I'm probably going to be, you know what I mean, waiting on the cloud is where I'm going to transition handheld. from this. Yeah, the cloud so, handheld. So that's that's. One product that is coming out, but my my kind of subject for this this category, yeah, it's called the Surefire Turbo. So it's going to be offered in a six in a uh, Scout Light series and a everyday carry handheld, um, and it's going to be offered in for both of those. They're going to have a short and a long version. Um, so <coughs> they're advertising for both variations of this handheld weapon metal light 18650, 18350. It's going to be uh, 17, or excuse me, 71,000 candela. Nice. Don't know what the lumen count is, um, but that candela level is up there with cloud. Yeah. Um, mod light, depending on your light, they, they kind of vary in candela, but. And Surefire was running that kind of their own uh, all wrapped in together uh, mounting system as well that goes straight into the M. That's what's super cool is their, yeah. their weapon mounted lights offer um, the pro mount, which is currently available on their. They're uh, dual fuel lights. Yeah. So it's, it's a built-in either Picatinny or m -lock mounting system that is fully adjustable. So you can adjust how high you can uh, best... Uh, Basically, it has like a little Almost hinge. like the cant. Yeah. You can, you can essentially just adjust the cant. It's, yeah, which it's is really hinge. cool. And it offers the light being extremely nice and far forward right out of the box, which and is nice for And it's very tight to the rail. Yes. Which is great, too. Yeah, so I'm really interested in that because I was... I remember seeing the M600s... Um, and I was kind of tempted to get an M600 with that mounting yeah. system because I really liked it. What well, saves you the 30 40 50 bucks for buying a, a mount on top of the light. Yeah, and as we all know, number one, less weight on the front of the gun. <laughs> Albeit not that much difference, yeah. obviously, but also the simpler the better. We know that from anything we're running on our guns, you know, always if you can simplify it, it's it's just that much better yeah. because it's less things that are going to break down, they're going to break, that need to be Loctited and witness marked. Like it's just, hey... This is all Surefire's problem. All I have to do is just put these in, lock tight them, yep. and witness mark them, and I'm good, you know? So if you're going to run, so these are dual fuel as well, which is super cool, because um, I wish yes. that was standard across mod lights. I think that'd be a, a leg up they yeah, could I get. I absolutely but, love the dual fuel design. So obviously there's going to be a downside with the dual fuel. The batteries are not as capable, so you're going to be running 33,000 Candela with one or two CR123s, depending on the size of your light. Now, for a pinch, that's awesome because um, you're still yeah. still getting, I, I would imagine, still some decent output. Uh, we'll see because, like I said, it depends on the lumens, and um, I think it's going to depend a little bit on the tone of the light. I don't know if they're going to go more blue or more more. Um, It'll be interesting orange. to see where they go with it. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. like, it'd be interesting if they went more orange so that, you know, because mod light's obviously, like, king of the blue. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so it'd be interesting if they decided to go more orange because and then... That would give them an opportunity to be like, hey, you know, if you want the more orange, stick with the turbo, you know, the turbo head, or if, you know, because Mod Light, they could go on the blue yeah. route of it almost. Makes you wonder how Surefire feels about Mod Light, like, making a whole industry around making their products better. Yeah. No, well, you know, I, now I, I wonder how their relationship Well, now is. they're actually competing with them. Yeah, which is interesting. You so. Know what I mean? It's, like, it's cool. I'm glad yeah. that, that Mod Light's doing that. It always makes you wonder, like, what Surefire's kind of, you know, how they receive that, you yeah. know? Yeah, competition's good. Um, it drives people to make better products, and hopefully over time we'll see a cost reduction because of this. Yes, 100%. So spot and spill. So 
according to Surefire's website, they claim it's going to have a good spotlight and it's still going to have usable spill for close quarter stuff. Oh, good. Um, and then they're also, uh, I didn't see a picture of this, but they're, they wrote about it on their website, that they're coming out with the new X300T-A, which is going to be their high output weapon mount of light. So I would imagine same profile because it's still taking two CR123 batteries and it's going to be 50,000 candela. Nice. Uh, which is nice. Um, it's kind of interesting, though, that they're, they were able to get 50,000 candela out of their uh, handgun light, but their weapon mount yeah, of light was... Two CR, yeah, the two CR123s out of the It's 33 out of, a, out of a, either handheld or weapon light. It's weird. I, it's the I same battery. The, I wonder what the battery life is going to be on the X300TA. Probably not terrific. Yeah, like... So that's kind of an interesting... That's kind of the down... That's where a lot of this high output light has been going. Um, well, yeah, we're kind of hitting that. We're getting... We're pushing... Yeah, that. we're pushing the limit of batteries, either CR123s or um, re rechargeables right now, 18350s, 18650s. And we're we're pushing it to a point where you're only getting like 30 minutes out of these small lights uh, yeah. for battery life. So it makes you kind of, Yeah, that'd be kind of interesting to see because yeah. now what they should do is start getting into CR123 profiled, um, uh, you know, rechargeable. Yeah. Like I'm surprised we haven't gone down that path. Like an 18650 that's, you know, smaller that you could double in or one that's an entire one pack that would Even go if the you back. do, you're, you're going to limit battery life. Yeah, definitely. With current technology. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see because, you know, just because we're seeing, you know, how the 18650s, same profile, but giving out so much more. Yeah. You know. So that'd be interesting to see. That is interesting how they were able to, you know, get that much more uh, power out of the uh, X300 TA, though. But I am really interested to see the uh, battery life because hopefully it's not too atrocious. There's a good chance I might be purchasing one of these uh, Surefire Turbos because I'm not super happy with my Mod Light weapon mount of light like oh, I've talked yeah. about before. Um, and then Cloud. Cloud is making progress, so they're coming out with a... Gen 2 Rain, which is slim. It's going to be their slim head series, which is going to be backwards compatible with uh, their old stuff. So if you have a body and a tail cap, um, you just purchase the new head. And if you have the old style tail cap, they'll include the new style tail cap and you'll be good to go and all that. But um, so that Cloud's making progress to be more competitive with Surefire now and Mod Light, um, which is nice. My problem with uh, Cloud is just the tape switches currently. Um, so unless they upgrade or change their tape switches, which they claim to be offering more options for that, uh, momentary only, they're going to offer one that's going to hook up with lasers and stuff, which will be cool. Yeah. Um, but if, if the, the pressure on those pads is going to be the same, then I'm probably going to switch over to the Surefire. Yeah. Well, because that was interesting too, because um, what you had a new experience with that we were in Colorado. Remember, like the your, light? Your, uh, yeah, your light just completely just kind of shot the bed. Remember, it's the, it's the same ongoing issue. Yeah, same one, but yeah. it, it got even like it just felt like you know it was a really yeah. Good... So I, I emailed Mod Light and they recommend using some dielectrical grease on the uh, fittings for the plug on the tape switch and the actual uh, tail cap itself. Yeah, um, it... and, then, and then lubing up the the threads with WD forty is what they said. So, I mean, like. I don't mess think... with enough plow mounts, all right, on trucks to know that dielectric grease seems like it only works for so long. It only does so. It's not a permanent fix is what I thought. Yeah, because, like, I mean, I've never had, like, I support the use of dielectric grease. I think it's a good thing. But I've never <laughs> had to use dielectric grease to make my Surefire work. That's my make, point. You know what I mean? Or make something Cloud, like... Cloud. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, that's a problem that I yes. feel like shouldn't... Especially yeah. when you ship the light and you don't... I don't, rem I don't and recall. You don't come with a, it doesn't come with a pack and a dielectric no. grease or doesn't. That just, yeah. I mean, like, I, that's great, but it yeah. shouldn't, that shouldn't be a problem. Like, So I, I have yet to buy some and try that, but I will. And I'll report back because if I still have issues with it, I'm going to follow up with them and be like, yeah, this is just broken. I need a new one. Yeah. And then maybe if I get a new one and it works, and then maybe and that problem solved. the mod solved. with the mod button? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I was going to say, that's, yeah. Now, it'd be one thing, like I said in the previous video, if I was the only person that had this issue, but since... I have seen on the internet other people having similar issues. I'm kind of leading it to be a quality control issue. Yeah. Um, we'll see. I'll try the grease and we'll go from there. But man, between you and Geisley and Mod Light, you just man, you just can't. I'm like it. I'm like Tim from the Military Arms Channel. I'm just a shit magnet. I guess. Yeah, you're just a lemon magnet, dude. Yeah. What's your first item? All right, so my first item is going to be on the other side of this note. 
somewhere in this notebook. Hold on. I messed up. Um, I believe it was the... Uh, the Mantis, right? Yeah, the, uh, is it, yeah, the Mantis. Blackbeard, was that one? Well, by golly, how did this even... I must have dropped it right before the show. Now I feel like that guy. Like, I didn't get my notes. Yeah, I know. It's here somewhere. Get your Hold pen on. and paper handy. Yeah, geez. Oh. Almost. Oh, no. Oh. We're way I in thought there. I said... I know. Hey, there, there it is. Are. The Mantis Blackbeard. That was um, right. <laughs> I know you were on it. Yeah, basically, um, this company, are, um, they're running this uh, thing called the Mantis Blackbeard. And so... It's a dry fire system for, I think it was, what, 250 um, Basically, it comes with a battery pack that goes in your magazine well and a, a bolt carrier slash charging handle kind of dingus-looking thing that you pull, out your, you pull out your bolt carrier group and your charging handle. You insert this, and the idea is that you can dry fire up to it's like four or it's like four rounds a second, or ten rounds a second, yeah. which, good, good luck there, Jerry. Jerry like, you know, <laughs> but, like, um, basically, what it does is it... It lets you use your your actual trigger break, your trigger weight, and everything to be able to dry fire. And I believe the way it looks like it was working is that it comes in and it, and it, and it sits right above where your trigger is so that it can fire. And then it'll just, it just sits at just enough where it can fire and then resets it. So that you can dry fire a lot. Like 70,000 trigger presses or something? Yeah, yeah. on per battery life, like yeah. 70,000 trigger presses of battery life. Um, of basically uh, using your actual trigger, which I think is a great, great option. Instead of, you know, because there's been a lot of other options out there. Obviously, one, charging it every time. Or just random, or just running, you know, a uh, already fallen hammer. Um, or or I, that what, little, I, what I do sometimes is just lock the bolt open, and then you kind of have that, that dead trigger. Yes. So there's that, and then there's also the, um, there's that other magazine-based one that goes in, like, on Glock stuff, like a... Uh, is it dry fire mag? I think it's dry fire mag, yeah. yeah. So those are those are an option too. So on this one, I'm really excited to see someone be able to bring out an efficient means of me actually being able to use my trigger. So I'm going to look into it a little more and see what other people think of it, like once there's a kind of a user base. Because honestly, it might be really worth it. Also, another part of it too <coughs> is that it has a little laser. So every time you fire it, a small laser, um, vis laser kind of becomes uh, visual outside the front of the barrel so that if you're on a target, you can actually get a little feedback on where you're coming up on. So that's also really good. Have you ever seen those red handguns that do that? Where it's like it's trigger press and then a laser shoots out? Yes. Yes. They're, they're a good trending aid for new shooters. Um, the handgun one specifically because you can kind of identify trigger issues. Uh, they're not perfect, but I think the AR one's cool um, because you get that kind of uh, reset of the trigger, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and it's your trigger. So it's similar idea to like the dry fire mag for, for Glocks, which... Um, I, I might get I might get one of those handgun dry fire mags at some yeah, point. I, I think I, I might do that. No. I don't really dry fire a rifle as much as handgun. Yeah, um, it's shooting but, a, shooting a rifle is easier. So yes, um, but it might be a really good option for being able to, um, you know, uh, you know, run certain scenarios for people, or you get some people together and do like a dry fire session, or yeah. you know, and um, <clears throat> obviously a nice thing about it as well is that you are. You're very obviously replacing the magazine, the bolt carrier, and the charging handle so that yep. when you're doing dry fire, you know, obviously you should always be safe and be able to separate your magazines and, and you know, be good to go. But it's going to make it so much easier not to accidentally have something happen in a loaded firearm. Well, there's no way. It yeah, there's, there's no way. Yeah. Like, unless you take it all out, put your gun back together, load it. And then be like, oh, let me do some more dry fire. Like, there's no way you can really do there's that. There's no way if those two components are in there, you can fire the gun. Precisely. The <laughs> entire fire, like, yeah. like everything but the actual fire control group itself is yeah. now just a big piece of but red the, like, plastic. the firing pin's not in the gun. Yeah, exactly. So, like, yeah. and there's no way. So, I think that's a really big benefit as well. Um, now, my next one is going to be the Aim Perfect Simulator. That sounds kind of neat. So, basically, um, what it is is it's, it's a... Um, it's a computer program, a little setup that turns your computer with a projector um, into a simulator, into a uh, into a um, simulation simulator, if you will. Um, <laughs> I'm trying. I forget, for some reason, I can't think of the right words for it. But basically, um, you project up onto a large piece of paper a um, a situation in which you can uh, you can defeat the threat, like you've seen in a lot of like like what police academies and stuff like yeah. that, like in the military where you kind of have um, simulators and whatnot. 
where so this one though you can take rather whether it's to an indoor range or whether it's to an outdoor range with the proper kind of uh, coverage or if you do it at the right time like say you do it at night or whatever uh, um it will project onto the screen an entire situation that you go through and when something comes up you can come up and fire on it and um it will actually detect the rounds going through the paper um and uh score you based on that and react based on that so it's actually really cool because you can do a live fire, you know, um, you know, situation, situation simulation. <laughs> so, uh, which is kind of cool, you know. Yeah. I mean, in all reality, like that brings a whole nother kind of whole another level to the to the simulation. Um, which I think, honestly, if you had if you have the means to do it, like if you have a nice berm and you have a little setup, you could really rock that. Like, there's no reason or we like couldn't. An indoor range or yeah, especially if an indoor range. Yeah. That's you know. Uh, optimal but like say for instance even with our situation you got yourself an easy up right and some black tarps to go on three sides at least um and then have it situated nice and close to a nice berm there's no reason you couldn't run lanes through that yeah and it's a 180 yeah it's it's 180 it's a single plane keeps it at like you know so it keeps it safe so even if you did put somebody in a box all the situations happening in front of them, so there's not going to be any like crazy going to the left or right. Exactly. So. You know, so you could actually, um, if you were to invest it, I don't know how much it is. You know what I mean? I think I, I should have checked the price, but basically, um, you can run that computer program, and as long as you have a projector and a computer, <clears throat> you're good to go. You know what I mean? Like and also, I, I don't know if this is the same or a different one than I've seen, um, but there is one where you can actually buy like a a blowback pistol that shoots a laser to go along with it. Okay, yeah. And the monitor will actually register the lasers as hits. Yeah. So you okay. can use it as like a dry fire aid. Um, yeah. So okay. you can have like USPSA targets and you can kind of like go through a stage and it'll register your hits. See, now another thing that I was thinking too, right, is that I don't see a reason why in this situation you couldn't take a piece of a little bit thinner paper because it <laughs> registers the shots on the, on the paper and the yep. holes in it. So I don't see the reason you couldn't um, you couldn't use like an airsoft gun, um, like that's that was like p- solid enough and a, like a thinner piece of paper, and in theory that would work. Yeah. Now I could be wrong, but we were thinking about this. We were talking about it before the podcast. So if you did want to say set it up in your garage, you could just set up kind of a little double setup of uh, like a tarp in the distance and then a piece of really thin paper that the projection goes on. Yeah, and in theory. You can make that work, but I almost wanted to say there was a way to use it, almost like a, like having a god yeah. gun or something. So, I don't know, but I think that was a that's a really cool like to be able to set up a lane to do that in a live fire scenario sounds really really interesting. Um, so I'll be interested to see kind of where that goes. <coughs> then one more thing is um, you're just gonna do all three. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, what the hell am I doing? I'm um, oh, sorry. For, sorry. We'll, save, you three, we'll save yours. You I, did three products. I did, I, but it was all under one. <laughs> see, I forgot about that. I yeah. thought, we, okay, yeah, go to your next one. Um, so my next one is FN is coming. They're re-releasing the high power, um, which is kind of kind of goes with this whole vintage vibe that gun community's kind of been in recently. Yeah. So you've seen a lot of like carry handle stuff, and and as of real recent, like 2022 on on social media, I've seen a lot of like. Roller delayed gas blowback stuff like HK, um, MP5s. Um, what's the 556 five, stuff called? The set me. Yeah, the set me's are one of them, but the HK one, I can't remember what they're called. Oh. And then G3s too. I've been seeing a lot of people post about that kind of stuff. Like the 5 the 551s five, five or 552s five, five, or whatever? No, those are SIGs. Oh, yeah. What am I thinking? Yeah. SIGs. Yeah, that H- was SIG. HK that was SIG when it was like OG SIG. You know, HK has like the G3, which is 308. Yes. They also have the 556 five, equivalent to it. It's like the same system, but it's di- downsized to a 5.56. I can't remember. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, it's essentially the Setmes, but uh, the Setmes are the Spanish version of it, from what I understand. But anyways. Oh, the C- not the C6. No, that's the, that, cause the Canadians have their version like the AR. Yeah, the no. But anyways, uh, there's a lot of vintage stuff going through the gun community. So uh, FN High Power, I think it's going to sell. That's, that's probably a good prediction. But um, So it's full metal gun. Um, 17 rounds though so the original was 13 from what I what I can remember um, so they increased the round count on on those guns um, single action um, which same as the original fully ambidextrous which on the originals was not the case on the 80s variants of it um, they 
they were. I think there was some like ambi safety ones. Yeah. Um, I, maybe the slide lock is now ambi. I'm not. I didn't quite sh sure. I'm not quite sure about that. But um, offer it in FDE black and stainless. Um, I just it's kind of it's not a super practical gun because it's all metal. Um, but I mean, for somebody that kind of likes that kind of vintage vibe, I'm sure it's gonna be it's gonna be nice. Yeah. No, that'll be really cool to see. And it's. It's a reputable company that's coming out with it. It's not like like um, Springfield Armory is coming out with it. It's yes, like FN, no, that's, FN that's, is coming out with it. Like, so. that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, no, I'll be... Oh, oh, we're getting a little guest, yeah. guest appearance. He wanted, to, he wanted to show his head, I yeah. suppose. <laughs> if, if, uh, you, if you don't pay attention to him, we'll go back and do yeah. that stuff. <laughs> so um, your next one? Sure. So mine's going to be the M&P 10 millimeter, right? So that'll be kind of cool, I think. Because... Um, we were actually talking a few months back about, because I was kind of looking into 10 millimeter handguns to use as like a, like an overt, um, <coughs> like an overt kind of backwoods, uh, you know, open carry gun, like hunting and stuff like that. And I, I think the 10 millimeter is well suited for that job. Um, and I considered the, uh, was it the Glock 20? Because um, I was like, okay, you know, it wouldn't be a bad gig. Because I obviously, I have the Glock 21, which is the 45 auto, and I could get a conversion for this. And I, I just, it doesn't really interest me. How much do those cost? Like 300 bucks anyways? What, these Gen 3s? No, the uh, conversions. Oh, yeah, yeah. They cost almost as much as like a yeah. used Glock. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I just, you know, and a lot of them aren't in stock. I don't know if there was a, when I was looking, there was a random surge of people wanting to convert their Glock 21s. But regardless, hmm. um, that was a that was a problem. So anyways, um, see, so yeah, I look at, uh, so this one, though, is... Uh, because I, I, like, I don't know, I like the style of the M&Ps a little bit, like when it comes to like a little bit bigger gun. Um, so anyways, I, what's he doing? Um, <laughs> so anyways, uh, this one though, one thing that really stuck out to me was the fact that it's a 15 plus one capacity yeah. in 10 millimeter, which is very, very attractive. What's the Glock, I mean, like 13? Or? Yeah, this 45's is, 13. the 45 is 13 plus one. What's the 10? Is it the same thing? It's probably very similar. Yeah. So... Which is pretty good. I mean, that's, you know, Glock 19 capacity. Obviously, it's not Glock 19 sized, but um, I think it's a great, you know, a great option. So, definitely uh, interested in waiting for that to come out. So, that was kind of, that was one that kind of stuck out to me. But uh, now, what do you got for your final one? Uh, so, Spiritus Systems, uh, kind of another group one. They're, they're coming out with three new products, but they're all kind of short. So, I just kind of grouped them together. So, I have the Spiritus Systems Mark IV. Uh, placard that I've kind of made into a chest rig. So they're coming out with the Mark V placard, uh, which is a completely modular version of the Mark IV. Um, so it's Molly on the front. So it's it's essentially a triple mag shingle um, that is all Molly on the front of it. And it has holes on the top that allow you to mount bungees to retain your magazines, but it's all modular. Um, and then they're gonna op they're offering some pouches that molly onto the front of the placard to make it like the Mark IV. So the Mark IV is kind of a double decker. It's got the triple shingle in the back and then it's got kind of a, a thinner, um, more shallow shallow pouch in the front where you can put a zip pouch or you can put like a, a double pistol magazine okay. pocket into it. So essentially they're just making a more modular version of that because um, that's kind of what Spiritus really goes for is all this modularity. Um, so you can kind of build stuff up and scale it down as you need to. Yeah. Um, so that's the first one. Their second one is they have this new line of pouches that they're coming out with um, that are, they're a Cordura material that they have perforated. Um, so it's got these like, almost like these uh, spike patterns in it. So it's like a three prong. Oh, yeah. Did you see these at all? I think I saw, I saw like you looking yeah. at your phone. So it's, it's essentially Cordura that they've cut in this like, this um, like three, it's, it's like a three pointed object that these cuts are in it. Um, so it, it allows the pouch to flex. So if you have like a double mag pouch um, and say you have like beefy P mags or you have like AK mags or something, um, it actually allows, you stuff the mags in there and then when you put the flap on the pouch, it actually expands out a little bit. Um, so it gives the pouch some give without being elastic. So, because the problem with elastic is it eventually wears out. Yeah. Uh, so this perforation allows it to naturally flex um, because there's kind of like relief cuts in the fabric. Um, now you might be thinking, oh, well, it's not very strong, um, but I, 
I saw videos of people where they put their finger in there, uh, like two fingers, and they tried to pull it apart as hard as they could, and they couldn't get the fabric to break. Really? Yeah. So it's okay. it's kind of like this weird compromise. Um, so definitely, um, it's kind of cool because I see it as like a a uh, a better version of like what Blue Force Gear did with their. Their, with uh, their 10-speed 10 10-speed 10 pouches, yeah. yeah. yeah 10 speed. Because those are nice because you take the mags out and they're flat. But then when you put something in there, they expand. These, now they're not going to be as flat as elastic that kind of constricts, but yeah, um, it's, still, it's still... Deflate a little. It's still, yeah, it'll deflate. That's cool. Um, and it also allows natural camouflage. Um, yeah, like some uh, three-dimensional three camouflage. Yeah, because it's going to break up the pattern of the pouch. Yeah, and see, if you get real tactical, you just stick sticks and leaves it, in it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's like the old, uh, like the old helmet covers, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, um, you know, there's 100 of these on the... Maybe not 100. There's like a dozen of these on the market. Um, but Spirit Systems is coming out with a hand warmer dangler pouch. So essentially, it's a hand warmer pouch. You stick both your hands in, and it sits below your chest rig or your plate carrier. Um, I'm definitely in the market for one of these, so I'll have to kind of compare a couple different ones. Yeah, but it's a wind-resistant material. This one's cool because it rolls up with a single zip. So That's nice. It kind of uh, rolls out of the way if you don't need it, and then you just unzip it, it rolls down. And then there is a zip, so you can put your chemical heaters in there, like your hand warmers. Um, so you can kind of keep the pouch warm, and then you just, when you stick your hands in there, it's already, it's already warm. And then it's lined with a very soft fleece material. Um, so kind of uh, some cool stuff, but. Yeah, my only thing so is how it's gonna interfere with um, medical kits down there. So if you, I thought the same thing, but if you put it under it, so if you run it behind. Oh, okay. So it could molly, it could molly or attach somehow under, like yeah. on that bottom. On the back? Like on the underside. In theory, it could Velcro too, but um, some, like the Mark IV chest rig has like, the drainage holes on the bottom, and you can get like shock cord attachments oh, okay. under there. I got gotcha. you. But some, um, <clears throat> some other carriers and stuff have attachments that run on the bottom. Gotcha. Yeah, because my my Haley just has elastic for like a tourniquet. Yep. So um, that'd be kind of some of them have. Um, I'd be interested in the uh, slightly sh more shallow one. Like you're running a slightly more shallow one, aren't you? I'm trying to remember. Medkit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I run the Faro Mini Dangler. Yeah, which seems a little bit easier. <clears throat> they start to get a little bit cumbersome. Yeah. Um, I mean, it really depends on what you need, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I mean, on the chest rig, it's not as bad. Once you start getting on a plate carrier, I don't know why. Yeah. It seems Because it sits a little lower, it, it's a little bit awkward, but yeah. not horrible. Um, so it's kind of one of those things. But that'd be really interesting to see um, how that would pan out. Now, in theory, you could you could also mount it on the back. So you'd, whenever you're chilling, you just have to <laughs> rest. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, um, that, that, That's like the... That's what we should have done in the military. Yeah, that would have been the, ultimate, the, been the ultimate army life hack. If they had it out, so you could just always yeah. be a parade rest talking to people. You know what I mean? But, um, no, so that, that that's kind of cool, too. That's definitely, like you were saying, it's been around. Um, like, duck hunters have been using them damn yeah. things for a long time, yeah. it seems like. But um, it's kind of cool that you're seeing it kind of bleed over into the tactical world. Yeah, I, I like the idea of it. Now, I haven't used one, but um, I was actually issued one, and I never used it. Really? Yeah. No I'm shoot a multicam one. Yeah, it does something. Um, but it, from what I remember, it wasn't. It was more just like a sleeve to keep your hands in. It wasn't very soft on the inside, but it had some insulation to it of mm -hmm. some sort. Um, yeah, I think it'd be a yeah. It yeah. I don't, I don't know, but um, if if you could get one that's very comfortable, doesn't really get in the way, and does keep your hands warm, I I can definitely see benefits for it around here because there's a lot of times where you're doing stuff with your hands and you don't want gloves on. But you um, you still need something to kind of shield your hands because you, it, it helps. Yeah, when I'm wearing helps. a belt, for instance, I can't always put my hands in my pockets. Okay, yeah, especially if you don't have slash pockets. Yep. Um, um, but like, even when I do at work, um, a lot of the time when I'm my holster sits because I wear my holster kind of more oh, forward. Yes, cause, yeah, because you're running an actual belt belt. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. So when I'm running like an outside the waistband setup, so like either a duty belt or whatever. Um, even if I'm just running an outside the waistband holster, I run my holster more forward and it gets in the way of my left pocket. So I don't always have the option to just put my hands right in my pockets. Yeah, especially if you're sitting down, you're on watch or something like that, yeah. but you can boop, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. just, it's the same idea as like a, a, like a sweatshirt pocket yeah. on the, on the sweatshirt. Yeah. No, I can definitely see that, you know, because what I always, what I've always kind of traditionally done is on like a plate carrier, you know, just boop, stick yeah. your hands there, but 
especially now that we're starting to get into a world of chest rigs, it's slowly yeah. starting yeah. to become more difficult. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but luckily with a lot of chest rigs too, because I wear a lot of like sweatshirts now, so you can always get under there. But if you're really dealing with like a long distance kind of wet weather situation or anything like that, you're not gonna be wearing a lot of cotton sweatshirts, yeah. you know. So yeah. kind of comes back around. But uh, so that'll be kind of interesting to see how that pans out. But yeah. But anyways, I think that about wraps it up. So, uh, well, actually, no. We got Rare Breed Triggers update. Um, so, just a quick uh, kind of what's up in the 2A update for Rare Breed Triggers. So, there were some leaked emails from the ATF that got kind of put out there. Um, so, the ATF is probably going to be coming for the FRT triggers, so the Force Reset triggers at the moment. Um, so, there's no official determination um that has come out from the ATF. They haven't knocked anybody's door at the moment, but the emails kind of lead people to believe that they will very shortly. Yeah. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, and just remember, you, you always have your uh, right to remain silent. So if you do own a uh, rare breed FRT trigger and the ATF shows at your door, you know, just remember your constitutional rights and, yeah. and uh, always seek counsel prior to speaking with law enforcement. That's just a good rule of thumb. Uh, rule of thumb. You're not being yeah. anti-cop or anything. That's just, that's your right. Yeah, it's your so. complete right to do that. Yep. Good legal counsel. Um, so just remember that. Um, and I think that about wraps up the episode. So. Most definitely. So. so if you guys like what you heard, you can follow us on social media. we got a Facebook, NH2A, Instagram, NH underscore 2A underscore. Type it in just like that. Uh, you will have to type it in just like that to find us due to shadow banning. Um, we also have a YouTube so if you guys want to watch our previous episodes on YouTube we have 80 something episodes up there so it's NH2A podcast um, or it's actually just it's NH2A on YouTube um, if you want to email us questions, comments, or concerns NH2A podcast at gmail.com and finally Patreon so if you guys want to help us progress this podcast um, help increasing the content I did get a new phone so hopefully the video quality is good um, we don't have videos for the last four because my uh, phone decided to shit the bed. So yeah, once uh, she goes, those once they get up on YouTube will just be audio. But uh, you guys will still enjoy them. So. Yeah. Uh, but Patreon, uh, NH2, NH2A. Just Google search NH2A Patreon, and you should be able to find us. Yeah. Um, and we'd appreciate any of that support. Most definitely. And before my dog explodes for some reason, <laughs> he was fine the whole time. I know. Now he's just he sounds like a like a tea kettle when you leave it on the stove for too long. He's just weird but anyways um <clears throat> so first of all guys be proficient right so um comes to all this stuff all these new products are cool and all but they don't matter a bit if you uh if you don't know what you're doing with them you know so if you don't know what you're doing find somebody who doesn't know what they're doing train with them um whether that's paying somebody whether that's a trusted friend who honestly knows what they're doing either way it's all good it's all training and once you do know what you're doing don't stop there you know get used to getting out there regularly and staying proficient right so one of our friends who does that is our friend Mac at Specialized Training Solutions. You can hit him up on Instagram at Specialized Training Solutions. You can email him, shootingwithmac at gmail.com. That's Mac spelled like mac and cheese, M-A-C. Um, next of all, all right, guys, uh, be politically active, right? So uh, every time something's coming down the pipeline, it definitely pays to get out there. Let your opinions be heard. Share your opinion in a kind manner, and that's well thought out, whether that's through Facebook, Instagram, if you're one of those weirdos who has Twitter, um, and so on and so forth, or just in person, you know what I mean? Um, get out there, and uh, or if you're one of those people who even still writes a letter to the editor, right? Explain yourself well and be, be well thought out, and you know, don't be temperamental. And um, with that being said, write letters, send emails, and uh, make calls to your local legislature when things are starting to come down the pipeline. It, it really does help, and it's important to be able to, you know, let your voice be heard. And um, finally, be polite. Be a good person. Be the kind of person the gun community would like to have you as a part of. And uh, as always, guys, being a good person, people are going to respect your opinion much, much more because they don't think it comes from a place of, you know, anger. And uh, so anyways, guys, follow the three Ps and we'll see you for 107. Take care.